So, um, talking again, uh, getting back to the beginning of your presidency, when you came into uh, the presidency in 68, was that 68? That's right, yeah. Um, what were some of your goals at that point? Uh, what were the things that you were hoping to focus on as president? Um, I'm not sure I came in with goals or if the goals came to, came to me um, because uh, as I had indicated, you know, I was struggling to find out what uh, what Allied Arts was all about. And uh, it seemed to many different things and, and different, different uh, to different people. Um, I kind of assumed that uh, that we would continue in doing the uh, urban environment things that we'd uh, always been doing, and then uh, then there were pl plenty of people that would bring problems to us. Did you know? Speaking of bringing problems, did you probably have heard about Betty Bowen? Betty Betty Bowen was this, another wonderful lady. Uh, who was the right hand person to to uh, Dr. Fuller at the C Seattle Art Museum when they were entirely in uh, Volunteer Park, and and uh, uh, she knew everybody in town, and and she kept track to all issues in town, and what she would do is call people in the morning. And say, love, you know. She said, "Good morning, love. I I wonder if you read that article in the in the Seattle Times this morning, you know, about such and such and such and such. What are we going to do about that, you know?" And so Betty always brought the problems and always had a suggestion, you know, and uh, and uh, she was wonderful. And I, she. She was uh, doing that. I, I later learned all over town. Everybody was getting calls from from Betty Bowen. She always had good ideas. And very concerned about the city. And very concerned about the city and about art. You know. She. Yeah. Anyway. So the goals just kind of. The goals, kind of, the goals and problems, kind of came to me. I th I'd say that's that's a fair assessment. I don't. I mean, it, it isn't the kind of thing where you s start out and say, "I've got these ten points." You know, uh, there was the. Uh, you know, there was the. Uh, I think Norm Johnson had 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 come in with a uh, an agenda of sorts. But of course, he had a longer history with the uh, with the organization, and he knew what was possible and what wasn't possible. And uh, anyway, so yeah, I'd say the problems came to us instead of us going to the problems. Now, one of the one of the things that kind of really marked your time in in, in uh, office was the Pike Place Market, and that continued for many years. For you, yes. being very active with the Pike Place Market um, preservation activities, one quote that I wanted to read to you that from you in 1996, um, there was an article about the market in '96 in the PI, and you said at that time, which I thought was really, um, it was very telling about your feelings and about Allied Arts, was people need to remember why we saved the market and what it was all about. It was a mixed community with an economic cross-section of people. It was never meant to be a fancy or high-priced place. It was not a rich man's place or a poor man's place. It was everybody's place. Um, so that's something that you said uh, more recently, but it certainly was very appropriate to the time as well. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, uh, the market activities and the preservation activities. Sure. That, uh, that thought, I didn't remember saying it, you know. Sounds also like a, a quote from uh, Victor, you see, because <clears throat> uh, Victor uh, was very much uh, 
dedicated to the idea to keep the keep the market as a humble place and and it and and it and it, and in those early days it was you know yeah uh, there was a time when there were something like five thousand single men living within uh, uh, a mile of the market you know mostly in single room occupancy hotels they were the they were the merchant mariners and the loggers and uh, the retired alcoholics and they were all the people that were there for the winter when their summer job was uh, was uh, not uh, functioning so uh, so the market was uh, um, uh, low priced produce at, at one time uh, across the street uh, across Pike Place there was the what Victor called the soft food the soft fruit area which meant the day old the fruit that was about to go you know and the day old bread and the week old bread and, and the horse meat you know and all the things that made it possible for people on, of of limited means to 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 live, you know, and um, and there were rummage sales and uh, and uh, and things of that nature. So that and so that's what Victor loved about the market, and I did too, you know. But that was also an earlier time, you know, and times kind of changed. The neighborhood changed. You know, and we and uh, we've tried to preserve uh, the some of the character of the of the market, uh, but it's a uphill battle sometimes. What was uh, the situation at that point when you were uh, when you came into Allied Arts and the state of the the market preservation activities? Okay, that was one of the first uh, problems that uh, that occurred. You know, we uh, and I knew very little about it and very little about the market at the time uh, I just uh, began to realize that there was a, a very serious conflict within within Allied Arts uh, and with good people on both sides and there was this group of, uh, uh, of the, uh, Victor Steinberg uh, followers you know uh, who um, were there to and friends of the market who were there trying to save the market and uh, as they saw it and there were the uh, at least two or, or more of the architects that were longtime members of Allied Arts Paul Kirk and uh, Dave McKinney uh, had uh, had uh, been retained by the uh, by the urban group, or the, not the urban group, but the uh, Pike Plaza group, to design a new market under urban renewal. And so there was a conflict right within the organization. And uh, we had a big meeting out at the, uh, out at the uh, um, uh, Seattle Center and uh, and uh, I was uh, chairing the meeting and trying to figure out what uh, what we should do, you know, and uh, and uh, very eloquent people, uh, you know, the people that thought urban renewal ought to go ahead were saying, well, the place is a wreck, you know, the. The, and this and some of this was true is structurally it's unsafe and and the um, plumbing isn't uh, operating satisfactorily and the and the cooling systems aren't uh, working and uh, and, uh, and it, it needs a big injection of remodeling or and by which they meant tear it down and and uh, 
and build according to their plan the the 5,000 car garage and the 50-story hotel and all that stuff. And uh, and here was Victor, you know, pleading for uh, for re retention of the character of the market. So anyway, that that's that's what it was like. And uh, for a while, uh, you know, I tried to r remain um, neutral for a while because because I felt it was Im important that that both both sides within the Allied Arts were treated uh, fairly. But, you know, Victor was very persuasive and, uh, and the organization gradually uh, shifted over uh, towards, uh, towards the Friends of the Market point of view. And, uh, and so, uh, well, I noticed that, that uh, the, the positions that Allied Arts was taking at that time were things like uh, uh, we are in favor of public ownership of the market or something like, something like that, which nobody dreamt was possible at the time. And uh, for a while, you know, we weren't really taking a position, but then we did, you know. Then, then it became apparent. And Victor came out with his book and and uh, and uh, we had uh, we all went to the champagne breakfast at the market to support the friends of the market and and uh, got just got involved in the in in what what was going on there and then so so uh, when I <clears throat> at some point and I can't remember when. I joined the Friends of the Market, and I became Vice President of the Friends of the Market um, sometime before the initiative, and uh, and uh, so so we had this combination of fundraisers, book sales, uh, and uh, and then uh, and then the active uh, active. Uh, pushing of the of the friends point of view within this, well what we what the friends of the market were trying to do at that time was to stop the city council from adopting the urban renewal plan and um, and then finally they did they finally they did adopt the urban renewal plan and uh, and uh, that would have been about 1970. So I would have been uh, finished with, uh, I would have been out of the Allied Arts office at that time. And, and uh, so it, um, but the Allied Arts and the Friends of the Market were always, well, Friends of the Market had started within Allied Arts. It was started as a committee of Allied Arts. So that was probably back in, 64 or thereabouts and about the time I came in so I was kind of uh, unaware of that at the time so we were trying to uh, wrestle with the question up there in Fred Bassetti's office uh, of uh, what we should do uh, and uh, the, with the city council had ordered that uh, torn down and uh, we had three choices, and um, one was to uh, simply have a vote uh, saying no urban renewal. Uh, we didn't know if we could do that because uh, it seemed to fly in the teeth of uh, certain federal preemptions at the time. Um, and. Uh, and the second thing, the second thought was uh, was simply to direct the city to to buy the market. There didn't seem to be any money available or enough money available to do that at the time. And so the third choice was to uh, declare it a historic district, which would make implementation of the of the uh, urban renewal plan, which was very destructive, uh, uh, 
impossible. And uh, so that's the route we went. So, so uh, uh, Victor and I and our, my friend uh, Ed Singler and uh, somebody who worked for Ed Singler named Bob Fecker, uh, who shouldn't be forgotten, all had a hand in drafting the initiative. Those were also lawyers? Pardon? Were, were uh, the, the other two gentlemen lawyers that you just mentioned? One was and one wasn't. Okay. Uh, Ed, Ed was a lawyer, um, but he wasn't practicing law. He was working for the city at the time, so he had to be uh, working anonymously at the time. And Bob Ficker worked for Ed in, in the... In the uh, and uh, um, so he had to work anonymously as well. Uh, but among us, we got it. We got it drafted. Tried to figure out what an initiative was and what form it should take. There wasn't a lot of precedent in those days. There was no Tim Iman to tell us how to do things. And um, and uh, we filed the initiative and and then went on the uh, campaign. And I don't know how much you want me to go into that. Uh, there's one, there was an interesting aspect to the campaign, I thought, uh, is that, first of all, a group of uh, the, the people, the development group, the Pike Place Plaza group that wanted to that thought they had an inside track to doing this big urban renewal development plan, uh, opened an office in the in the uh, in the um, economy market down at the market, and and uh, their address was 93 Pike Place, so they called themselves the Committee to Save the Market. And uh, uh, 93 Pike Place, and I'll tell you, there was we spent half of our time trying to persuade, trying to help people understand that the committee to save the market was the committee that wanted to tear down the market, and and then um, we had our friends of the market campaign committee, and they we met uh, every. Saturday at at my house, over in uh, in uh, in uh, Madison Park, and then there was another group that came along uh, involving uh, Tim Mannering and Harriet Sherburn and a few other people, uh, Jack Baghdad, and and uh, they they felt that. The Friends of the Market probably wasn't capable of carrying out a modern uh, political campaign of this uh, size. And so they formed a group called the Alliance for a Living Market. And uh, so we had the three groups, you know. And, uh, and pretty soon we realized that we had to make common, common cause. There was some hard feelings at first, you know, uh, the feeling that the, the some uh, some people and the friends thought that the alliance was just a bunch of uh, of uh, goody two shoe new newcomers, you know, and and uh, and uh, the, some people in the alliance, you know, felt that the friends were country bumpkins who, you know, who couldn't handle this big problem. So, so we, uh, anyway, we, we finally made common cause. And I think I had a role in, in trying to keep the two of them together. And, and, and they, so they joined us in our Saturday morning meetings, uh, through the time of the campaign. And, and, uh, so we'd get together and discuss these these things and uh, discuss what to do next. Uh, to give you an idea, the uh, in the whole campaign, 
the friends of the market raised about twenty-five thousand dollars, and the alliance ra um, raised about the same amount of money. So our total nest egg was about fifty thousand um, dollars, which was big bucks for the time, and we don't know how much the uh, uh, how much the uh, committee to save the market. But we'd go out and have to public meetings and here would be these nice young people from the committee to save the market. You know, they never, they hired people to do uh, well-spoken people and, and uh, to talk, talk about how the market would uh, needed repairs and replacement. So th that was the way the, the battle went. Uh, it, it was a kind of uh, nip and tuck for a long time. And then uh, there was another group uh, of young lawyers in the uh, city called uh, Choose an Effective City Council, Check. Uh, a bunch of young lawyers that had worked very hard to get some new faces on the city council which had been terribly tradition bound up until that time. And then they helped elect uh, uh, Bruce Chapman and, uh, and uh, uh, Tim Hill and uh, Wing Luke and a bunch of other really good people uh, on the council. So anyway, they ch uh, check uh, filed, uh, made a demand uh, that the committee to save the market uh, disclose its uh, donors. And, uh, and uh, after a while they were forced to do that. And then, then they held a press conference and it was very clear the the friends of the market, our donors were two dollars and five dollars and ten dollars and you know, the thousand of people and uh, and, uh, and their donors were uh, the Gus Dosis and, and uh, uh, the, the Central Association and, and uh, the major real estate developers and, and so forth. You know who would give five thousand and ten thousand? And they had a big war chest, but it made all of a sudden it became very clear who was uh, for the initiative and who was against the initiative, and that was a real turning point. That press conference. Uh, in the meantime, it was an uphill battle, though, and uh, and uh, we were suffering from the fact that. Uh, all the major entities in town, both papers uh, and uh, all three um, television stations uh, and the downtown business association and the chamber of commerce and everybody else you could identify uh, were against the initiative. Even the mayor, is that true? Well, and the mayor, especially the mayor, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But he he turned he turned around. Right? He did. He did. Yes. Yeah. He did. And that was uh, who was the mayor at the time? Pardon? Who was the mayor at the time? Uh, that was uh, well. That was Wes Allman. Yeah. That was Wes Allman. And uh, and uh, and he said, "Well, you know, you won, and uh, and we'll uh, we'll work with you." And of course. That that made it possible, you know, to uh, and then then these other this other group uh, came up with the idea of forming a public corporation to buy the market, as and so the uh, urban renewal people would come in, and we developed a new urban renewal plan which was based on preservation. Uh, instead of uh, destruction, and and so the uh, the urban renewal people would come in and they would condemn the building or take it or buy it, 
Uh, most owners were ready, quite ready to sell at that point. So they would buy it and then they would develop a, a plan for the reha rehabilitation of the building and uh, the future use of the building uh, that fit in with the general scheme. And then they would turn around and sell it to, to this new public corporation, which was the PDA, the you see, so, uh, so that that uh, that permitted the city ultimately to become the owner of uh, of the market. Something I didn't think was ever possible, and we went ahead with uh, with renovating it. And by that time, well, I I left the market. I was on the Historic Commission for a while and then I finished my term there and then I th thought I was done with the market issues for a while and I went on did other things uh, and uh, uh, having to do with energy issues um, and uh, then uh, I got a call from Tim Mannering and he said, uh, about 76, and he said, uh, I think you ought to come down and be a member of the board of the, of the Preservation Authority. And I said, well, I don't know, you know. And then he said, uh, yeah, you better do that. And I, I said, okay, I'll do that. Well, I came down, and then he said, by the way, he said, uh, we're going to ask you to be chairman of it. I said, I don't even know what you do. <laughs> he said, well, yeah, you figured out. <laughs> so I came in as chair. <laughs> and that was 76? That was 76. Now, you have a letter, don't you, that was from 76, uh, from Victor Steinbrook, is that I do, I do, yeah. Do you want to show us that letter? Oh, sure. I'm very proud of this letter. I got it from Victor on April 16, 76. Should we try to show it or should I read it? Um, you could do, we could do both. We okay. Do both. Yeah. Uh, this at this point, you know, we thought much of the uh, of the market battles were over. I should we should have known they were just beginning, but uh, but he said, uh, dear Jerry, I want to thank you most sincerely for the great help that you have given to the market cause over a long period of time. I feel that I can take the liberty in this situation of speaking for all of the friends and friends uh, capital of the market in expressing our appreciation. No one will ever know how much you have really contributed through your dedication and skill and judgment but I do have some measure of how significantly you have contributed. Cordially, Victor. That was a very nice letter. Okay. Can you film? It's too much glare. I'll, I'll film it afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, I was very pleased to receive that. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about the... Um the later, the later episodes of the of the market preservation. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we could again go back a little bit. Um, and another battle that related to preservation was Pioneer Square. Yes. And uh, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit because that was also something that happened, or it was still part of your your time in office as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, Pioneer Square was. Uh, just beginning to show some signs of uh, life. It had been uh, it had been uh, pretty much a rundown, shabby uh, area, of storage and empty stores and and uh, all that uh, for quite a long period of time. And but then it was just beginning. There were a few venturesome people that had come down there. There was an interior designer had come down and um, and um, opened a uh, an office on like oh, on First Avenue 
and and uh, some young people had come down and opened a tavern called the Blue Banjo uh, in in a corner of the mark of the square, and then uh, Ralph Anderson, uh, a noted architect, and and Dick White, who was a gallery owner, had bought a building down there called the Globe Building. And uh, and Dick White was going to open his uh, gallery in an adjacent building. And um, Allied Arts was interested in in promoting uh, in promoting some restoration down there, and and uh, and so uh, we did uh, two things. One one we uh, decided to move our office down. That was my second year. Uh, and that was somewhat controversial within the org organization. There were some people on the board who thought they wouldn't care to come down there at night to a meeting. And, um, and uh, we, we tried to dissuade them. Uh, but anyway, the majority finally did vote, and, uh, and uh, the White and, uh, and Anderson gave us a, a good, uh, a good uh, deal on the, on the second floor of the Globe Building, and uh, quite a lot of space, and uh, we fixed it up, and we, we took it, uh, we did a lot of things uh, jointly in those days uh, with other groups, and uh, and we took it. Uh, we took it. Uh, we rented the space with the American Institute of Planners and the American Institute of Interior Designers, and it seems to me there was one other group. Land, American is the landscape architects, I think, and. Uh, and uh, and so among us, we had enough to pay this discounted rent, and we moved up there. And so that was an exciting time. You know, we had, we're in this grand old building with the big windows, looking out over a parking lot, you know, which is now uh, Occidental Park. And and uh, so one uh, one time. Uh, some of the young architects, uh, including Jim Olson, agreed to paint the uh, paint the surface of the. I don't know how they got all the cars off it. Um, I think they maybe they got an agreement from the owner, and anyway, so they painted a park down there on the on the asphalt surface, and uh, the green and pathways and stuff. So, and to see how it might look, and that that ha had some uh, some impetus because it it helped the city realize that uh, it could be a park, which, so, very which it became, yeah, which it became, and and somewhere in there the uh, the uh, city also agreed to, to adopt a historic preservation ordinance and. Uh, and uh, and uh, so so things began to turn around. People began to move back in, and I think it didn't hurt that uh, that Allied Arts had its uh, main office down there. And our office in those days, by the way, was kind of a busy operation. It was uh, Alice Rooney was there, of course, full time, and she had assembled a uh, a group of. Um, Vista volunteers, you know, uh, or some kind of uh, of a, there was a program which the, uh, the they were paid by the city or the feds and and they would work in something that would uh, be of interest in their career and so she had two or three people working with her down there, so we had quite an office going and uh, and uh, added I think to the to the st stability of the neighborhood in the long run. And you were kind of a clearinghouse for artists and art groups, weren't you? Yeah, I think so, yeah, yeah.
I remember reading that uh, that you answered. You actually answered the phones for some groups and took messages for them. And oh, oh. Alice did that. With them. Alice yeah. may have done that. Yeah. I, I, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. We had a lot of a lot going. We were we were trying to do things like uh, like that, like you know, just as an information service for artists and and uh, and uh, and to uh, do some things to promote new galleries and 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 uh, some stuff like that. So. We had visits to studios, and there were a number of programs going on, yeah. Now, at that time, um, Fred was talking to us about the Action Better Cities uh, oh, yeah. book that he put together with a bunch of other architects. And right. That was uh, something that Allied Arts supported and uh, praised, actually, in the newspaper. And there was a, there was a, a little op-ed piece in the newspaper at the time from you when you were president talking about Action Better City and and, co and complimenting the plan. Yeah. Um, so could you talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Action Better Cities was really started by the AIA, the American Institute of Architects, local chapter. And uh, I recall Bill Bain Jr. as being the as being the primary uh, advocate there. Although he wasn't the only one, there was another another person uh, named Young, uh, architect. And and uh, anyway, they they had uh, at that time the AIA local chapter was uh, was quite activist, you know, and they were determined. And Fred Bassetti was there, and and now Bumgartner and and uh, and uh, Ib Nelson, you know, and lots of people that were had the had the improvement of the city downtown cityscape. You know, all this, Seattle had no no downtown center at all in in those days. You know, there was there was just nothing to identify. You know, to identify it was just some buildings and streets and and uh, and so they were pushing for uh, various solutions to that and improving the the uh, streetscape and improving the 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 flow of traffic and so forth uh, um, and they, so they came up with this very imaginative plan and uh, and and presented it of course being architects they had lots of graphs and uh, and uh, drawings and pictures, and it, it got uh, a lot of publicity. You know, I would say that it, it kind of reminds me that um, during that period of time, uh, I always looked for uh, the opportunity to work with other groups in pursuing civic uh, causes, and. And uh, we had a very active uh, uh, assortment of, uh, of people. The AIA was very helpful and and uh, and forceful, you know. And and the uh, landscape architects were there, and the design groups were there, and and uh, and the roadside council was there, and and so you know we could we could uh, always get four or five major groups when we were petitioning the city council for one thing or another, uh, which we often did for one thing or another. <laughs> yeah. That's a, little, so, that's a lot of strength. With, with well, it was. I felt there was strength in numbers, and I felt it was more effective, and it certainly helped us when we had a hearing, you know, to... Uh, to um, to uh, to have that support, I thought it was essential. That kind of dropped by the wayside after a while, and I, I was sorry to see that. But anyway, it uh, it was working well at that time. Action Better City was was kind of part of it. It came a little later, and 
And, uh, well, you know, one of the problems that came up uh, during that time was Lake Union. And uh, we realized that uh, people were uh, down there were, who were filling in the lake. They built an atrocity of a development called Roanoke Reef on the uh, west side of the lake that was built in big uh, apartment development built entirely over the lake. And uh, there was another person uh, down on the southern part of Lake Union that was uh, using it as a dumping ground. They'd come and they'd fill and they'd fill, they'd fill. The, the state had made the big mistake of uh, leasing, of selling some of the leased lands of, 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 uh, around the lake to private, adjacent private developers. So there, there was a lot of encroachment. And, and we uh, got together with our groups and the men at this time we added the uh, we added the lake yeah, the uh, floating homes association which was a group of the of the houseboat owners and renters headed by Terry Pettis who was another remarkable person in the picture at that time he was just a he was a distinguished looking he looked like uh, I don't know. My looked like Monty Woolley or something. He was a just a distinguished-looking man with a full, full beard. He had a long history of uh, of left-wing causes, and um, and I think had written at one time for the Seattle Star. And but at that time, at uh, the time we got together, he he was uh, uh, he was trying to save the houseboats. Which were, were kind of getting pushed out. Houseboats were, were houseboats were getting pushed out. Uh, people were encroaching on the street ends terribly. They weren't marked, and people would just gradually occupy them. So people, the street ends ran into the lake, you see, and uh, provided public access. But the neighbors would crowd into them, and pretty soon they disappear. And so, and we. It had some studies that showed the various sizes of Lake Union over the years. At one time it was a big lake, and then it was kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller as people filled in and filled in. And so something needed to be done if we were going to save it. So we got our groups together, and and uh, and, uh, uh, and Jack Robertson was uh, was the ringleader, I thought, and and uh, or well, and I was too. We were both workers on it, and and uh, we went to the city council and, and with a petition saying you've got to do something, and asked them to declare a moratorium on uh, on buildings over the lake. Well, they weren't quite ready to do that. Uh, but they created a, uh, a Lake Union Commission of um, citizens to study the uses around the lake and, uh, and the encroachment on the lake and the, and the restoration of street ends as public space and the possible development of, of, of other public space for, uh, for uh, public parks public access. So so uh, they appointed this commission. Phyllis Lamphere was, I think, head of the council at the time, and and she, uh, uh, so of course I was on the commission for <laughs> a couple of years, and, and launched a rather thorough study done by uh, Lee Copeland's office, a local architect and planner. And uh, and during that time, they sort of held off on. Uh, I don't know if there was an official moratorium, but nobody wanted to build down there uh, with this hanging over their head. And and so we eventually developed a, a plan of uh, appropriate uses and appropriate restraints on filling in the water. And the city uh, went around and. Uh, 
put in uh, signposts showing exactly where all of the uh, street ends were and, and pushed people off. Uh, you know, so the, all that was, uh, that was a good start. And then, and then the Shorelines Management Act was passed. So, so that kind of superseded everything. So then, then it was all controlled. So what we ended up doing, I think, was basically a holding action and uh, slowed down development and uh, came up with some guidelines that were useful in the, uh, in the future. Okay, um, what I'd like to do is just go over a couple of the um, very special things that also happened during your presidency. Okay. And it um, looks like we have about 15 minutes, so I'll try to, you know, go through these. And you can make some comments about them. Okay, sure. I need at least one or two minutes for the things I need to film as well. Okay. Okay. Um, just one uh, couple of things that came up during your presidency that were really new and special. Um, one was the film festival that took place in 68. Right. Which uh, certainly was uh, unique at that point. It was. Could you it, talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure. You know, at, the, at that time, you know, they, they, there was only one, there was only one theater in Seattle that showed any, uh, th any films that were uh, not ordinary run-of-the-mill Hollywood films, and, and that was the Ridgemont out uh, in, on Finney somewhere. And, uh, and they, would, they had the audacity to show British films and, and uh, things like The Moon is Blue and stuff like that. And, and, uh, uh, and uh, what was the other? Anyway. So there, there was there was not a market for or or an opportunity to see uh, films of, uh, of of an experimental uh, or avant-garde nature, and so we decided to. I don't know why we that was audacious of us really. Um, we decided to have a underground film festival, and we got independent filmmakers from all over Canada and all over the United States uh, to come and, and show their films. And, and uh, we showed them at the, uh, at the uh, various uh, rooms in the, uh, at the uh, Science Center, which at that time was run, run by Dixie Lee Ray, who was up until that point, pretty friendly to uh, to Allied Arts, so it was a successful uh, thing. We had uh, we had uh, our notices. We had uh, posters out around the city, and uh, and uh, we had uh, gee, I can't remember all films. They they probably would seem tame these days, you know, but uh, they were pretty exciting, and they opened up a door. Uh, that hadn't been opened uh, before. One of one of Dixie's Dixie Lee Ray's guards, however, went, wandered into one of the one of the theaters and reported back to her that there was nudity, <laughs> and so we had a we, we we were a little bit afraid she was going to shut us down there, but I think we talked her out of that. <laughs> that was uh, that was not. The typical Seattle film at that point. No, oh no, no, no. This was all. No, there were no, there were no films like these. You know, but they weren't, they weren't uh, outrageous films or anything. They were just innovative, and, and, and uh, so yeah, that so we, we and 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 we felt that we were accomplishing a serious purpose, you know, because we really were trying to open the door to the outside world of arts, and, and especially in film arts, and, uh, and uh, by George, we did it, <laughs> you know. The and Seattle. people came, and, man, I, and uh, I, don't, I don't know that specific concrete things happened as a result of it, but it certainly opened some eyes and some horizons.
Now, another thing that you did that opened up a lot of eyes was the Lively Arts program. Yes, oh which my was indeed. Yes. Subtitled A Trip into Multimedia. Yes. And it was considered to be a happening um, yes. in 1969 and got rave reviews. Yes. The PIN, the Seattle Times, I think Wayne Johnson and Ralph Stromberg. Yes. Um, and uh, attracted uh, almost 2,000 people. Yeah. And that was on one day in May of 1969. Yep. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Well, we co-sponsored that uh, with the uh, Seattle Opera, and uh, and uh, uh, oh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know exactly who had the idea, you know. But it, somebody was uh, promoting the idea that we would have uh, sculpture. Doris Chase uh, was a prominent sculptress in in those days, and. And uh, dance and uh, music and light and uh, and just to put it all together in the uh, opera house and uh, and uh, and we did. We almost lost our shirt, you know, but because we did, never did well at producing, you know, things as as Alice Rooney would tell you and will tell you. Uh, but you know, but it was fun, and it was a, it was something new. There was another thing Allied Arts did in the way of of, of uh, light shows. Uh, we did also do we also did another happening, and in the uh, in the uh, Ames Theater down there down at the Science Center, uh, the City Council, believe it or not, uh, was about ready to was considering an ordinance. And in those days, in that time, they would have light and music. The young people would have light, lights and music, and the the lights were generally shown through a uh, uh, through a uh, kind of a, of a of a uh, gel or something, you know. So you'd get lots of colors floating around, different forms. And there was there were a couple groups that. That did these light shows, and then there were then some people supplied the music for them, and and it was kind of a rave thing at the time. Well, the city council uh, was concerned, some members that this was a this was a uh, a danger to the public morals, you know, to have this kind of thing going on, you know, and and uh, so uh, uh, see, uh, the Allied Arts sponsored a uh, an, another happening and a light show and music and the Ames Theater had lights and invited all the members of the city council to come down and see it. <laughs> Did they change their minds a little bit? Yeah, I, the, 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 I, the, the thing died at the, after that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, only two or three members came down, you know, to, to see it. But they realized that this was not a threat to public safety. Um, a couple of other things I wanted to mention. Um, one was the while you were, again while you were president, you had a summer residency for the Joffrey Ballet. Yes. And um, you did a couple of design tours. Uh, at one of Vancouver. And one of Victoria. Well, Victoria was a little bit before, but Vancouver was, I think, around 68, 69. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if you might have a few comments about, about those, the residency of the Joffrey and uh, um, the design tour of, Victor of Vancouver. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, you know, and. And in regard to the Joffrey, I'd have to say I think we we served as a as a as, as sort of an umbrella sponsor, you know, and and uh, and and moral support and and uh, to try to give it. Joffrey wasn't as well known in those days as uh, as it became, and and uh, so I think we were we were just about we were just more of a. Of a endorser, and as I recall it, and and uh, and, uh, and sponsor than an actual participant, uh, because they whatever they did here they did on their own, you know. 
but uh, the trip I do recall, of course, is the, is the one to Victoria. And I can't remember if that happened during my term or not. But we took the boat up to Victoria. And the Victoria, uh, and again, we invited members of the city council along. And a couple of them came, including uh, Mrs. Uh, Harlan Edwards, a nice lady. And... Uh, and uh, we went up there, and the, and the uh, city designers in Victoria showed us uh, what what they were doing, and uh, and uh, and uh, what the plans were, and the, the squares, and the plantings, and and uh, just and just some good urban design things were happening up there, and um, and so uh, it was good to see for all of us. And and uh, especially good for the city council people to see, and then uh, we came uh, came back on the boat, and uh, we, there was a kind of a party, you know. There was lots of wine and beer and and and, and uh, cocktails and food, and when we just had a nice uh, a nice trip back, and 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 got better acquainted with the. Our relationships with the city council were getting a little better in those days because we were, tr we were trying to stay friends with them. And you had a Invite them along, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well the, uh, as we come down to a close, I just, there's just like one or two things that I definitely wanted to cover really quickly. Um, one is, and you can just speak about this really quickly if you'd like, there was a, a proposal for the summer for a summer arts festival um, in 1969, which unfortunately didn't um, come to pass. Right. But it seemed to set the stage for the future summer arts festivals like Bumbershoot. And I'm just wondering if you can recall the beginnings of Bumbershoot and it, did that in any way connect with uh, with your desire to see a summer arts festival? I really can't make that uh, connection. I. Um, uh, <coughs> I think it was typical of the role of, of of Allied Arts in those days, you know, to promote ideas and and concepts and and to try to give them a push when we could, and um, and certainly that was the case of the of the professional theater and that was the case of the professional opera, and and uh, and uh, I think that was the case of the uh, of the summer arts. Uh, the 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 the, uh, the uh, I think Seafair was already going at that time, so so we didn't. Have, so I I really can't say much more than that about it, except except it was our typical role, you know. It's, it was just kind of elusive, you know. It's just uh, but we we did what we could to promote ideas. And are there some people that you especially remember um, really enjoying working with in, in Allied Arts? Oh, sure, a bunch, you know, a bunch of people, you know, and Joe Scherzen was one of them, you know. And then, but of course, Victor Steinbrook, you know, I felt I was so lucky to have had him in my life, you know. Uh, he's such a very special person. And uh, and so dedicated to saving the market and uh, and to urban uh, preservation, historic preservation in general, you know. So he opened everybody's eyes to that, and he was just a good person to know and work with. And and uh, the, the other person, of course, was Jack Robertson, who I regarded as a real mentor. He taught me a lot about how to how to organize. Uh, Groups and and how to pre present uh, positions and and how to be reliable. You know, I uh, Jack always uh, wanted everything based on the facts, and and Victor too. You know, Victor was a detailed person. He, if he was going to talk about urban renewal, he would he would know exactly what he was talking about. And so th those, 
those people were were very special. Bob Block was in a very somewhat different category, you know. Uh, he was uh, he, an extraordinary person who was uh, deeply involved in the, all aspects of the of city uh, urban life and city life, and uh, had uh, always had lots of ideas and lots of energy and and uh, and and good points of view. Yeah, he was a great person. We had lots of our our annual foundation uh, gatherings were always at Bob's house up on uh, uh, on Ter Terrace Place up in see uh, up in Capitol Hill, and um, and they were always um, memorable occasions. You know, yeah. And you worked for a long, long time with Alice. Um, oh my yes, yeah. I didn't, I didn't mean to neglect Alice. Alice was the spirit of, and soul of uh, of, of Allied Arts, and and uh, she's just a, a wonderful person to work with, and she knows uh, and absolutely everybody in this city, and. Uh, she always had something to bring. You know, she was wonderful. She was kind of the, she, she was always the, sort of the paid staff, you know, not paid very much, uh, you know, but she, and she never usurped the position of the presidency, which it would be easy to, for her to do, but, but, uh, uh, but she just always saw to it that we did the right thing, you know. <laughs> Wonderful lady. That's a, I think that's a great way to... Okay. To